We're talking about real symmetric matrices and some of their applications. We went through some properties about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Then in a previous video, we looked at how we could use those properties to solve linear systems of algebraic equations where the coefficient matrix is real and symmetric. We're going to start looking in this video at another application, which is a great setting to introduce this idea of diagonalization, which I've been alluding to and mentioning throughout several of the previous videos. But first, let's introduce the quadratic form, which is the, the framework that we're going to use, the context that we're going to use to introduce diagonalization. And then we'll talk about diagonalization in the next video. So of course, everything that we're doing throughout chapter one and chapter two so far is focusing on linear systems of algebraic equations. And so that sounds very limiting, right? We're linear systems, so that leaves out all the nonlinear equations that we could imagine or encounter. However, there is one interesting situation where there is a nonlinear equation that we can convert into a system of linear algebraic equations and then use these, these linear algebra methods. So that is the quadratic expression. When you think of quadratic, you think of something squared, right? The quadratic formula, something is squared. So it's a polynomial of degree two that we're thinking about. And again, we're, we'll get to this in the next video, but we're gonna use this as the context in which to introduce the idea of diagonalization. And the reason for that is because we'll have a very geometric, intuitive feel for what's going on with these quadratics, and therefore what the diagonalization process is doing. And then we'll extend it and broaden it to a, a broader scope of, of problems. So this is what a quadratic would look like. For simplicity, we're just going to focus on second degree expressions. We're not going to include any first degree. So no x's by themselves and no constant terms, just to keep things a little bit simpler. So let's say we have capital N variables, x1 through x cap n. And then the quadratic terms have x's times x's. So these could be x times itself, like x1 squared, x2 squared, and so on. Or it could be an x times another x, like x1 times x2, x1 times x3, and every other possible combination of an x times another x. So you can see we have two types of terms, x's times themselves and x's times other x's. We're going to use these a coefficients with double subscripts, and you'll see why we order them and number them in the way that we do in a moment. But you'll notice here also this 2. So all of these I'll call them mixed product terms. They have a two. And the reason for that is obviously x1 times x2 and x2 times x1, those are the same terms. These are scalar variables. The order doesn't matter. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put half of the coefficient of x1 and x2 in the one, two slot in the matrix A, and then the other half in the x2, x1 slot. Same thing here, half goes in the x1, x3 slot, the other half goes in the x3, x1 slot. You'll see in an example how that works out. So this is our quadratic form. And these a's are going to be the elements within what will turn out to be a real symmetric matrix. So here's how we can write this in matrix form. The constant script a here is just x transpose times a times x. x is the vector of scalar variables, x1 through xn and A is going to be an n by n matrix of these coefficients of each of the terms, as we'll see. Lots of applications of this, uh, many of which you're familiar with. So in 2D, so you saw this in calculus class, this is where you get your conic curves, so ellipse, hyperbola, parabola types of uh, quadratics. In 3D, so now x1, x2, x3, now you get your quadric surface, so ellipsoids, paraboloids, hyperboloids, so three-dimensional uh, versions of those 2D shapes. In mechanics, lots of these quadratics. Moments of inertia are quadratics. Angular momentum of a rotating body is a quadratic. Kinetic energy is a quadratic. So kinetic energy, you know, it's one-half m times the velocity squared. So velocity squared, that's a quadratic. The potential or strain energy of a linear spring so you may remember from a physics class at some point, you have a linear elastic spring and you stretch it and the force is one half times k times the elongation squared. So it's a, it's a quadratic. When we talk about optimization and control, this is in part three of this book as well as the variational methods book. 
you're going to see lots of quadratics. It's very common for the objective function or the objective functional to be a quadratic. Okay, so how can we reduce this now nonlinear, very special type of nonlinear, but nonlinear equation into a system of linear algebraic equations? So we have one single quadratic equation in capital N variables. We're going to convert that into a linear system of N equations. And then we can use all of our linear algebra. And it's easy to see how to do this. Everything is squared, right? So just take the derivative with respect to each of your variables. So we're going to introduce a new variable y. There'll be capital N of them, same number as the number of x's. And we're going to take the partial derivative of our quadratic x transpose times a times x with respect to each of the x variables. The one half here is just to get rid of the inevitable twos. Okay, so if you do that with respect to x1, you get this equation, x2, x3, all the way to xn. So in this way, you get the system of n linear algebraic equations. So notice the coefficients now are nicely ordered in our usual matrix form. So a11, 2, 2, through nn, those are down the main diagonals. a12, that's in the first row, second column. A1n, first row, nth column. A12, which is the same as this. So that's in the second row, first column. And again, we're just emphasizing, you can see the symmetry of our A matrix. And so these are equal to each of these y's that we've just defined. So we now have a system of linear algebra equations, AX equals y x are the original variables, x1 through xn. y are these new variables, that y1 through yn, that give us this matrix form, linear system form of the quadratic. So the key here is that A is now an n by n real symmetric matrix. So those properties that we talked about in the previous videos, those now can be applied to this particular system. So now we can also write our quadratic in different ways. We already talked about x transpose times a times x. Now a times x, well that's y, so we can write this as the inner product of x and y. So they all give us the same quadratic. So let's do a, a simple two-dimensional illustration just to see how given a quadratic we can form this matrix form and see that indeed x transpose times a times x does give us this quadratic. So we have 3x1 squared minus 2x1 x2 plus 3x2 squared is equal to 8. The 8 is that script A, it's just a constant. And the coefficients of the x1 squared terms, that's a11, so that's 3. The coefficient of the x2 squared term, that's also 3, so that's a22. There's nothing particularly significant, the fact that those are the same. And then the minus 2x1, x2 term, remember, half of it goes to the 1, 2, half of it goes to the 2, 1 position. So half of this is, of course, minus 1. So a1, 2 is minus 1. And a2, 1 is the same as a1, 2. So now we have our 2 by 2 matrix A. a1, 1, and a2 are 3 and 3. And Again, no significance about those being the same. A12 and A12, those have to be the same. They're minus 1. Half of the coefficient goes into the upper right corner. The other half goes into the lower left corner. So now let's kind of work backwards. If we take our x transpose times a times x, we should get back that same quadratic that we started with. So let's just do that quickly just to have some confidence that it works the way we expect. So here's our x transpose, here's x, and here's the 2 by 2 matrix A. So let's multiply these two together. So 3 times x1 minus 1 times x2, that's the first row, minus 1 times x1 plus 3 times x2, that's the second row of our 2 by 1 vector. Then pre-multiply x transpose. So x1 times 3x1 minus x2, right here, plus x2 times minus x1 plus 3x2, which is right here. Simplify a little bit, and indeed we get back to the original quadratic that we started with. 
So all as I've shown is we've kind of gone in a big circle, but I've shown that, that indeed it is the case that x transpose times ax, where a is defined in the way that we discussed, is indeed the quadratic form. Some comments about this and introduce some new terminology. So if it is such that for any non-zero x, so that's our vector of variables, for any non-zero x vector, if it's true that our quadratic is always positive, so if we evaluate x transpose times a times x for any non-zero x, if it's always positive, we say it's positive definite. Or in other words, it's definitely positive. Now, the way we'll kind of shorthand that is to say that the matrix A itself, the real symmetric matrix A itself, is positive definite. But what we're really saying is the quadratic itself is definitely positive for any non-zero x. One way you can test for that is you take your real symmetric matrix A and you get the eigenvalues. If all of the eigenvalues are positive, then you can prove that A is positive definite. And this is one of our if and only if statements. So if they're all positive, the eigenvalues, then it is a positive definite matrix. If it's positive definite, then indeed all the eigenvalues will be positive as well. If the eigenvalues are all non-negative, in other words, you have one or more that are zero, then we say that the matrix is positive semi-definite, or the quadratic is positive semi-definite. There's a very powerful decomposition called Cholesky decomposition, and that's discussed in uh, chapter six when we talk about numerical methods. And it applies to real symmetric matrices. And it's so efficient that in fact, one of the most efficient ways to check to see whether a matrix is indeed positive definite is to attempt to perform the Cholesky decomposition. If you can do it, if there is one, then it's positive definite. If not, then it's not positive definite. There are some examples in mechanics where based on physical considerations, you can show that, for example, the elasticity tensor is positive definite. It's symmetric as, as well as being positive definite. Now this is where we segue into this diagonalization process because you're thinking, well, I don't, I'm not seeing anything diagonal here. That's the whole point. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take that general quadratic form and we're gonna geometrically diagonalize it to produce what's called the canonical form. Canonical is just a fancy term for standard. So we're gonna put our quadratic into a standard form. So what that would look like mathematically is we would only have x squared terms. So x1 squared, x2 squared, through xn squared. There'd be no mixed products. No x1 times x2, x2 times x3. No mixed products of x's. Then our A matrix would indeed be diagonal, right? So what that means geometrically is if you think of an ellipse, okay? So that ellipse can have any orientation. If the major and minor axes are aligned with the x and y axes, for example, then we say it's in canonical or standard form. So if we take a general ellipse at any angle, it's not in standard canonical form. But if we can put it in standard canonical form, then it'll be such that A is diagonal. So we will be diagonalizing A. So once again, we'll have a very clear geometric interpretation of what the diagonalization process is doing. Mathematically, we're going to be diagonalizing the matrix A, but in terms of the quadratic itself, we're going to be putting in its canonical form. And that means it is rotated in such a way that the axes of our coordinate system align with the major minor axes of the conic or conical section. This is the basis for the parallel axis theorem. You may remember when you do moments of inertia, you know, you have a shape, you look in the back of a book someplace, you get the moment of inertia about its centroid, but then you want to get the moment of inertia of that object around some other parallel axis. So the parallel axis theorem allows us to do that. That's essentially based on the same process.